Assalamu alaikum khawatun hazrat. Wasim Hassan welcomes you to lecture number 28 of Marketing for Nonprofits MKT 728 at the Virtual University of Pakistan. The component of learning is going to be about pricing strategies. Uh, we know that uh, everything that we talk about or we learn it has to have a strategic perspective, which means it has to take a strategic shape and form. Uh, the concepts take um, strategic shape and form on the basis of strategic objectives. So in other words, if we are clear about the pricing objectives, we have no problem uh, putting in place the right compatible pricing strategies. We know that uh, we can have uh, a few different kinds of uh, pricing objectives. The one happens to be profitability maximization. The other one is the recovery of costs. Uh, we see to it that uh, we can recover a substantial portion of our costs because uh, that it will make us rely less and less on outside funding, which comes to us by way of um, aids, um, grants, and uh, the other uh, the forms of uh, donations. Our objective uh, may as well be to maximize the usage because we happen to be setting a service or a program which uh, has to benefit each and every um, client uh, within the society. So depending upon uh, the program, we have to have the right objectives and based on those objectives, we have to put in place compatible strategies. We can have uh, three different kinds of uh, pricing strategies. The one is cost-oriented pricing. The other one is value-based pricing, whereas the third one is known as sliding scale uh, pricing. All these are um, direct uh, translations of uh, the three different uh, kinds of uh, pricing objectives that may that we may have uh, to ourselves, and uh, therefore we have to see to it that uh, the objective has a, a very clear um, link and alignment with the strategy that uh, we uh, intend to uh, put in place. Let us uh, first of all talk about the cost-oriented pricing, which basically makes us um, consider. Uh, things like uh, marginal costs, um, total costs, uh, fixed overheads, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these are the kind of components of uh, costing that uh, we are uh, very familiar with from our basic courses in accounting and finance. And uh, we know that uh, these are the components that uh, let us know the kind of profitability that we may enjoy at the end of the day. Because we know our costs, we are clear about uh, all the uh, components and could we know the kind of profitability that we need to have in order to sustain ourselves. Now the question here is, in order to sustain ourselves as a nonprofit, profit what is it that we want to recover uh, by selling that particular service or that particular tangible product and the, what really is it that uh, we think should come our way by way of um, aids and uh, grants. Once we have taken stock of uh, our marginal and total costs, but we have to consider another two components. The one is what we may call markup pricing, and the other one is what we call cost plus pricing. Let me explain the difference between these two components. The difference happens to be very marginal, but nevertheless, I need to talk about that. Markup pricing basically is addition of a certain fixed percentage to the cost that uh, the people have incurred, meaning people who are in business. Markup pricing is very popular among retailers and uh, the contractors, so to say. Retailers in particular because they are into trading and they sell products which are finished already. 
Given the fact that uh, retailers basically deal with uh, branded items uh, which uh, are offered to them uh, by uh, companies uh, that are into the brand management in a big way, costing and pricing structures are offered to retailers uh, by those manufacturers or brand managers. And therefore, the markups uh, which are added at different stages of the supply chain, uh, meaning the markup for the wholesaler, the markup for the retailer, are suggested basically by the manufacturers or for that matter relevant brand managers. Cost plus pricing also has a similar conceptual trust, but it really differentiates itself on a separate count. And that is, it has to take into consideration certain factors which are non-routine, which are not the kind of routine things that are going to happen at the retail outlets, meaning products sold at different retail outlets, regardless of the size of the outlet, it could be a huge supermarket, it could be a round the corner, like the mom and pop store, uh, the costing and pricing structures remain the same. And therefore, there is a factor of routine taking place uh, at those retail outlets, which is not the case with uh, the so many nonprofits. Let us talk about the example of a blood collection center where they have to collect blood and then uh, process it for onward distribution to different hospitals. Well, there's a cost involved in collection of that blood. And then you see there is a cost factor which is related to processing of that blood because you have to have a lab where tests are carried out and there's a cost associated with that. And then there's a cost which is associated to distribution of that blood to different hospitals. So in other words, these are the kind of non routine things which take place at this particular blood collection center. We can draw a relationship or a factor of similarity between this kind of a facility and a manufacturing facility where branded items are produced because both are engaged in ascertaining the level of cost or the magnitude of cost associated to different activities performed there, meaning at their respective places. May that be a factory or may that be a blood collection facility. But we also know a fact of life that nonprofits do not happen to charge the full costs to their clients. As a matter of fact, there are many nonprofits that they do not price their products for more than 50% of the costs, leaving the rest to be filled through grants, aids, donations, etc. And therefore, nonprofit organizations have got to be very sensitive to the fact as to what exactly are their costs so that they can work out the level of grants and aids which they have to get from different sources, from the government or from different foundations or donors or so on and so forth. So therefore, we can say that this basically is a cost minus pricing instead of cost plus pricing. When we talk about the nonprofit sector, in order to be very sensitive to our the costing and different components that we deal with, in order to come up with the exact cost, regardless of the subsidy factor which I was talking about in terms of grants and aids, we've got to take into consideration things like the break even point, because that is a tool which really enables organizations to pinpoint the exact costs associated with all those things that are variable within an organization and all those things that are fixed in any organization. So once we know our variable costs and our fixed costs, we can work out the break-even volume or the number of products that we have to sell or the number of transactions that have to take place while we are dealing with a service in order to know where exactly is the break-even point. And uh, we know that uh, the break-even point basically is derived by dividing fixed costs of any organization by the contribution margin. And we also know that the contribution margin is basically price minus the variable cost. So uh, once you put this formula into place, you get the break-even volume. So once we have the break-even volume, we are sure about the costs that we incur. And we also can be very clear about the remaining amount 
that, uh, that we have to generate through funding from different sources. Beauty of uh, this uh, the break-even point is that, uh, that this the basis the our costing by taking into consideration different cost uh, factors or cost components. This is not something that, uh, that takes into consideration different demand levels. But if we take into consideration demand levels, then uh, we cannot stick with one price. And in today's market, uh, whether we are uh, into the commercial sector or operating in the non-profit sector, uh, we have to be uh, very clear about our costs uh, because there always is a level of competition and uh, we've got to make sure that uh, whatever the costing is, it has to be in the neighborhood of uh, what it is costing others. Uh, because that way uh, we end up uh, with uh, kind of a pricing uh, which is competitive. And that's the beauty of this competitive pricing and this kind of a strategy that uh, we do not take into consideration demand levels uh, because uh, once demand uh, goes very high, we may be tempted into raising the price accordingly, which should not be the case because socially it is not fair and economically also it is not beneficial in the long run. And therefore we can say that the beauty of this particular tool, which is known as the break-even point, is that buyers and sellers can get into a buying and selling relationship based on the working of the break-even point. The fact of the matter is that uh, the business world, not only the non-profits, the business world has become very transparent. And uh, when buyers and sellers uh, get into transactions so that they can trash out some long-term relationships, they do talk about each other's uh, the costing factors. And nothing is hidden nowadays uh, from the other party. And therefore, uh, this uh, the break-in point uh, brings some sanity into the relationship because it demonstrates things which are worked out in just about the similar fashion and two degrees which are very similar in terms of the different organizations making the whole thing very close to each other and hence very competitive. So. Cost plus pricing is uh, a strategy which uh, is followed uh, by some of the non-profit organizations. And uh, I would say those non-profit organizations that uh, really want to be very sensitive to the fact as to what should be the extent of costs uh, recovered uh, through um, their uh, uh, product sales or um, you know, service sales and what portion should be recovered uh, through um, grants, aids, and donations of different kinds and sorts. The second strategy is uh, what experts call value-based uh, pricing. This is a very interesting phenomenon and uh, a strategic uh, approach because uh, it takes into consideration the value of the product or the service in the mind of your target market. Experts uh, they tend to agree uh, with each other that uh, whatever is the perceived value of your product or service in the minds of your um, target market should be capitalized on. And they go on to say that uh, the organizations uh, they should tend to recover as much uh, portion of their cost as possible. They go on to say that a substantial uh, the portion of the cost that uh, should be recovered uh, by determining this uh, the value-based uh, the pricing mechanism. And it is because of this particular approach that uh, so many different the universities that have uh, the very high tuition fee when they offer highly specialized courses because they know they're offering something of, of very high value. And uh, it is not uh, that they think so, it is uh, perceived as such by their uh, target market. And therefore, they really can have an opportunity to recover a substantial portion of the costs they incur to develop uh, that particular course or such like the high level uh, specialized courses for which they think they should be charging a very high level of tuition fee. Um, it all depends on um, their uh, uh, costing uh, structures, also uh, the taking into consideration the ethical side of uh, their thinking, uh, to what extent they think uh, they should be charging 
and uh, to what extent they should be generating funds through other sources. But the fact remains that uh, uh, organizations they do charge for the value which is perceived by their clients. Experts go on to say that in order to make sure that the service, which is very highly valuable, could be afforded by a large portion of the target market, organizations should follow the principle of what they say, differential pricing. Differential pricing makes it possible for those portions of the target market that otherwise they may not be in a position to pay you the premium pricing which you think should be the final price and is the price which will let you recover a substantial portion of the cost. And therefore, they have a scale starting from the premium side of the price extending toward another end within the two having different price points with which they offer to different portions of their market. How they do that? Well, it is a function of the product they offer and the features they offer with that particular product. And uh, the uh, qualification criteria which they put in place in order to uh, determine as to what segment of the population should be charged the premium uh, end of the pricing and which segment of the population should be charged those uh, pricing levels which are affordable by those target market members. So it is a very interesting concept and uh, the, uh, the practice uh, that uh, experts go on to say that uh, for different abilities to pay, organizations must have multiple pricing points. So this is the crux of this uh, particular approach. This uh, pricing strategy is followed by those organizations that are convinced about their ability to charge a premium price. And those are the organizations that are into services which are very highly specialized. I gave you the example of universities that offer very highly specialized courses. And only when organizations are convinced about their ability to develop uh, the kind of services which could be sold at a very high level of pricing, uh, one should not venture into maximizing profitability. So in other words, it takes us back to the objective. We should not really have uh, the objective of maximizing profits unless we are dealing with kind of a service or a product which is highly specialized and to which our target market attaches a very high level of value. And that is why we call it value-based pricing. So what happens is organizations are in a position, substantial portions of their costs. As a matter of fact, now they also can make a little bit of profitability. And once they have that profitability sitting as part of their reserves, they are in a position to move ahead to refine those programs and to develop a similar more products. So they have the money available for further investments. They have less and less reliance on endowments or grants or aids donations, etc. The third pricing strategy is what experts call the sliding scale of the pricing. I've talked about um, the differential pricing uh, while I was uh, talking about uh, the value-based uh, the pricing mechanism. And uh, I don't really want you to be confused about uh, these uh, pricing uh, mechanisms because uh, the sliding scale also sounds similar to that uh, differential pricing, which has uh, the multiple pricing points. Where is the difference? Well, the difference is very subtle. We do not charge a premium pricing. That is the major difference. Even when we are dealing with something that happens to be very highly specialized. For example, let's talk about uh, SKMHT, the um, cancer hospital. Okay, we know that uh, cancer treatment is okay, very expensive, but then okay, we're not out there to charge our clients uh, a premium pricing. Okay, we charge whatever could be affordable or uh, what is reasonable. And therefore, okay, we have a differential uh, pricing level here as well, okay, but the top pricing point does not start from the premium point. Okay, we have okay, the different pricing levels and okay, we try to assess and judge 
uh, what is it that people really can pay? It is very tricky and uh, it is difficult to verify uh, the income levels of uh, our clients because uh, we don't know um, from the face of uh, somebody as to how much the person uh, should be earning or what is the kind of uh, the socioeconomic bracket he actually belongs to. But then you see there are certain ways and means that uh, the organizations follow in order to uh, make their assessments. Uh, for example, at Shaukat Khanum, they start with questions like, uh, where do you live? And I think that this particular question makes it uh, pretty clear as to what uh, should be the socioeconomic bracket uh, where somebody falls. And uh, there are uh, the other questions at the same time uh, which uh, really uh, give them uh, a lot of insight into establishing uh, the factor of uh, the socioeconomic status of their uh, different clients. Uh, here, I would like to uh, give you uh, the one more example uh, followed by organizations you know, within developed societies. They tend to look at their tax returns and uh, they are in uh, contact with uh, the different tax preparation clinics uh, where uh, these uh, returns are uh, prepared and uh, they have a way of finding out uh, how much tax somebody has paid to establish the socioeconomic bracket. I would like to give you another example which is absolutely amazing uh, and it is followed by uh, one of um, the most prominent nonprofits uh, in our country. I'm going to talk about the society which is known as uh, the Pakistan Society for the Rehabilitation of the Disabled, abbreviated as PSRD. And uh, this is a hospital which basically deals with orthopedics. Established back in 1957, hospital has come a long way. And I'm going to give you a few more examples uh, in relation to uh, some other concepts. But here, I would like to confine myself with the way the way they assess their clients. They do not say no to any clients. And therefore, we can assume that the different people from different socioeconomic brackets that come to that hospital for treatment. And the hospital has a particular unit which is known as uh, the assessment unit, uh, or rather assessment section. They have social welfare officers sitting as part of that section whose responsibilities are varied. And uh, part of their responsibilities is to assess the socioeconomic brackets within which different clients fall. And they go to the extent of visiting homes of their clients and then deciding whether to charge or not to charge. Uh, the fact is they have um, also multiple uh, pricing points uh, starting from category A to category E. So in other words, they have five categories and all I can tell you is that it is the lowest category, which is E, um, constituting about 20% of their uh, total um, customer base or client base, they do not charge at all because they think those people cannot afford to pay at all. Whereas uh, the remaining four categories are charged differently, meaning uh, they are subject to differential uh, pricing points uh, depending on uh, their um, income levels and their social status. So that is why uh, this uh, pricing approach is known as uh, uh, sliding scale uh, pricing approach. And this is how it uh, differentiates itself um, from the other one that I talked about earlier, that which happens to be value-based. Value-based is all about the premium pricing, and uh, this one is all about affordability. So in other words, uh, we can say that uh, this is um, a pricing strategy that also uh, happens to be a function of uh, maximizing usage. You happen to be uh, dealing with um, a service that you think uh, should be uh, offered um, at a very broad level of the society. I mean, if uh, somebody has met with an accident and has come to your hospital with a broken limb, uh, regardless of uh, the social status or the income level, the person has got to be admitted and treated. And uh, this is how you can relate this particular strategy 
uh, in terms of it being translated from the objective of maximization of usage. Let me summarize this particular concept of uh, the pricing strategies in terms of a graphical presentation. As you can see from this particular slide, which says uh, strategic considerations, everything starts from objectives. The upper box, which carries three sub boxes inside it, uh, cost recovery, profit maximization, and usage maximization are all about objectives of the organization. So depending upon which objective could we have to play up and uh, could we have to have a strategy for, could we move on to the strategic formulation? And uh, that is why could we have this small arrow leading us toward uh, strategies, uh, starting with uh, cost-oriented strategy, then value-oriented strategy, and then usage-oriented strategy. It goes without saying that cost-oriented strategy is a reflection of cost recovery, whereas value-oriented strategy is a translation of profit maximization, and usage-oriented strategy, which basically is the sliding scale pricing strategy, is a, a reflection of maximizing uh, usage of the product or service that the organization sells. And at the end of the slide, we can see a two sided box okay, which says donations and revenues in green. So in other words, okay, by having one particular strategy, okay, we generate a certain level of revenues okay, which uh, are represented by this green triangle area of the box and the remaining is represented by grants, aids and donations. So this is okay, all about uh, pricing strategies which basically are a translation of pricing objectives. And with this, we are done with this particular segment. This segment is about offering new products. So in other words, I'm going to talk about product development. And we are quite very familiar with this particular concept in relation to brand management or basic with the marketing management course. When it comes to developing products, it is as much important for nonprofits as it is for commercial entities because nonprofits also they have to stay on top of things. They have to rejuvenate the purpose of the organization every now and then. They have to be very competitive and they have to sustain themselves by introducing new programs or bringing in new features to existing programs so that things do not become stale and do not lose sight of the fact that we are operating in a very competitive environment in which we also have competitors. Even if we do not have direct competitors, could we have competitors by way of uh, some other causes uh, toward which um, common donors and um, grant givers uh, they give their donations and grants. And therefore, could we've got to be very sensitive to the fact that uh, our programs are rejuvenated and uh, uh, refurbished uh, every now and then. And when I say every now and then, it doesn't really mean very frequently. Whenever we think that we really can bring in something tangible and something which will be appreciated by the clients, we should do that. And with the help of examples that I'm going to give you as part of this segment, things are going to become clear as to what could be the features that may make our products and services rejuvenated. The fact is, that strategic product development is something which cannot be left to the whims, likes, and dislikes of managers. This is something that, again, has to take a strategic shape and form. And uh, everything has to have a strategic rationale. So likewise, the new products that uh, we may have uh, as part of the pipeline uh, have got to have a strategic background. And uh, in order for us to develop uh, that kind of uh, the background, uh, we need to have an insight into uh, the two major areas. And those areas are again uh, very familiar to all of us, uh, meaning all the students of uh, the marketing, including myself. And those are the market and the second is the product. So why is it that I'm gonna talk about the market and the product? Because uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, the market and uh, the product, uh, the ones uh, that we start undertaking development of new offerings for that particular market. And the reason I say 
the product because uh, we are dealing with the existing product which is in the process of uh, either rejuvenation, um, um, extension, or maybe it is going to be sold as is, as existing product, but it remains the product. That's why I really concentrate on these uh, two major factors. Now, but once we have taken into consideration these two particular factors, we again have to draw some distinction between and among them. Let us talk about the distinction among them and with that start with the market. The market could be divided into three different areas and the one is the existing market, the other one is new market that is similar and the third one is the market which is absolutely dissimilar. And by the same token, we can classify the product into the three different areas. The one is what we may call extension of existing product. The other one is new product that is similar. And the third one is a new product that is dissimilar. So in other words, a product to see which is absolutely different from the one that we are or have been dealing with. This is a very a comprehensive uh, kind of a concept and uh, let me explain uh, this to you with the help of uh, another uh, graphical presentation. As you can see from this particular matrix, we have product right on top in the yellow area and uh, it is classified into A, B and C. A is the existing product, B is a new product that is similar and C is the one that is this similar. Now if we move a little leftwards, could we see the market with which is mentioned in um, a vertical form and uh, we see the market classified into three areas again as existing market represented as A1, new market but similar um, represented as A2 and new market represented as A3 which is absolutely dissimilar. So in other words, could we are talking about two major factors, the product and the market and both are divided into three respective areas and those areas are existing, similar, dissimilar. Now let us concentrate on A which is the existing product and if you go downwards meaning vertically you see cells with one, two and three. If you take a very concentrated look at cell one you have the factors of market penetration, the cost reduction and share maintenance. Now, these are the three factors which I would like to explain in a little detail. The market penetration is all about increasing the usage of the product. Here, you try to increase the patronage which your target market may have toward your product. And you like to enhance that. And you enhance that by bringing in certain improvements in your program, which could be the uh, the back office improvements, not really uh, the making a demonstration uh, when the service or the product is sold uh, to your clients. The second one is cost reduction, that you are uh, out to reduce your costs and you concentrate on your costs uh, because you are part of a program uh, which really has touched the optimal level of sales or the optimal level of delivery and you do not really see any further the potential of growth in the program. And I think an example of a family planning program in a developed country, there could be an excellent example where the organizations could rest assured that the program will not further grow and making it incumbent on those organizations to start moving to those the developing countries where the a problem of uh, the family planning still persists. The third factor is that of uh, the shared maintenance. You again are uh, having an objective to just maintain the share because you are content with the status quo. And this again is uh, the kind of representation of a similar uh, situation which I talked about in relation to the family planning program. And the reason I'm talking about these uh, the factors is because we are talking about the existing product and we are also talking about the existing market. So in other words, we are talking about cells A and A1. If we get into A and A2, we see our market getting extended. And here you see we are extending the market. 
that we are still selling our existing product, but we are moving to another market. And uh, this could be a case of uh, the Shaukat Khanum, uh, the moving from Lahore to Peshawar uh, and, and from there to Karachi. They still sell the same product, the same services, and they have a similar uh, the hospital, uh, but it only uh, is a question of uh, a new market and uh, they're going to do something which is very similar to them and they've been doing that for the last so many decades. The third one, which happens to be A and A3, is uh, the market development. Here, I'm talking about the challenges of realigning variables of marketing mix. You may get surprised because why I'm talking about this particular concept, which happens to be a thing of the past. Well, let us talk about uh, the concept of building blocks. And here, we have an opportunity to once again talk about those factors which are the backbone of the spine of the whole marketing effort. We are talking about uh, the existing product that uh, we want to sell in a market that happens to be dissimilar. Um, in other words, we are talking about uh, the experience that we've had over the last couple of decades or a number of years of uh, having been involved with that particular product uh, that is to be sold in a dissimilar market, uh, but uh, it is the features of the market that are not really known to us. Even if they're known to us, they're not uh, uh, really uh, presented to us uh, in practical shape and form, and we still have to practice those. In other words, we still have to experience those. And while undertaking that experience, we may bring about uh, certain changes uh, in application of those variables um, in terms of uh, there being ingredients of the overall recipe. You remember the concept I talked about in terms of uh, considering the marketing mix as a grand recipe of which there are so many different ingredients. And it is here that we have to decide which one is to be um, consumed to what extent? For example, we may end up deciding that we have to carry out a lot more advertising and promotions in this particular market because we have to see to it that our product creates awareness and it is tried by the target market and it becomes successful. We may also face certain challenges of the distribution because distribution mechanism it happens to be a little uh, different from the traditional kind of mechanism to which we are used to. I'm talking about a hypothetical situation and this is something which should form the basis of our understanding as to why and how we have to realign the different variables of marketing mix. So we may do something with our distribution patterns. We may shift our base from the traditional mechanism and get into something more ingenious, something more uh, modern, and uh, do that in line with what is acceptable or what could be immediately acceptable in that particular market. In other words, the distribution or the channel partners that we are going to be dealing with uh, should feel comfortable with the distribution practices that we have to undertake. So these two examples uh, are uh, the ones uh, that should be um, more than enough to understand what really is meant by uh, the challenges of realigning the variables of marketing mix. Now, if we get move uh, once again to the graphical the presentation that uh, I showed you uh, just a uh, moment ago, I would like to uh, talk about uh, the remaining cells uh, within the, uh, the matrix, uh, which uh, are all about extension of the product, diversification of uh, the product, meaning a new product altogether, and diversification of the market. In other words, what I'm saying here is, there are so many different cells. So in, instead of talking about all those cells the one by one, I'm trying to simplify things and uh, putting the whole thing in kind of a summary which should appeal to all of us. And uh, I am saying that uh, we should concentrate on three particular factors for the while that we undertake um, development of new offerings and new markets. And those three factors are, whatever we undertake has to be either an extension of the existing product or diversification, which means a new product altogether or a diversification of the market, a new market altogether. Now, 
I'm talking about all those cells where we are not uh, concerned with the existing product. We are out of that uh, the penetration uh, the mode, meaning where we wanted to the penetrate more and more into the existing market. We are now into newer markets. We may have um, existing products which have been given certain new features, but the fact remains that uh, we are trying to understand uh, where these new products that are diversified or new markets that are diversified fit into this conceptual framework. Let me take you back uh, to that particular hospital, uh, rather that society which I was talking about a little earlier, and that is the PSRD. The PSRD is an excellent example of a wonderful service they have been rendering over the past so many decades. Like I said earlier, having been established in 1957, the organization really has come a long way and their journey continues even today and they keep doing different things. They keep introducing new offerings and they keep getting into new markets which are similar and which also may be dissimilar. But I'm going to give you examples from the real life situation. So let me give you the one example uh, from their uh, the existing market, although uh, I'm onto uh, the new products and new markets. But this particular example, uh, which is going to be the point of departure, is going to form the basis of the whole thing. And that is about uh, the penetration. The, uh, the hospital, uh, somewhere along the line, decided to have different wards uh, for male patients, uh, female patients, and children patients. Now. This is something which really strengthened the overall appeal. Although the people went to the hospital while they were in a state of emergency, but these are the kind of features that really strengthen your products. And these are newer features. These are extra features which at one time were not there. And once introduced, they have the potential to induce a higher level of patronage on part of your target market. So this is an example with which is a real life example. They also got into things like the introduction of central oxygen system attached with the different beds and rather with all the beds and that elevated the comfort level of patients as well as their families that the oxygen could be supplied whenever need be. And uh, this is another uh, feature which uh, strengthened uh, the existing product. And as a matter of fact, it did uh, give the existing product some kind of extension. And uh, if uh, we look at it as uh, the different product altogether, uh, which we may, and then uh, we can say that uh, this is an added feature uh, which makes the existing product as uh, the kind of an extended product. Let me give you another example of uh, the offer extension. The, the hospital also uh, has gotten into an area uh, which is uh, known as uh, the physiotherapy. And uh, we all know that uh, the physiotherapy basically is an exercise carried out uh, by therapists to um, activate the uh, functional ability of the disabled body. So in other words, uh, once somebody has been treated in the hospital, and uh, you know they, their limbs could have been um, uh, put back together, or they have been um, uh, given um, artificial limbs with which are uh, fitted uh, because uh, unfortunately they lost their limbs. Um, they need to have some kind of physiotherapy afterwards, with which is a different product altogether. I mean, it is not the responsibility of the hospital to uh, have that uh, the facility in-house. I mean, once somebody has been uh, treated and uh, has recovered from the ailment or from the operation, uh, physiotherapy could be uh, given elsewhere. But the hospital decided to have a section where this physiotherapy could be uh, offered to their uh, the patients. And uh, they are successfully offering this particular service to the fullest satisfaction of for their client base. I'm going to give you another example of offer diversification because the hospital did not stop offering new products and they offered occupational and speech therapy. 
these two therapies uh, are offered by the hospital in order to bring disabled uh, the people who have uh, some kind of impairment in terms of uh, the mental disorder or physical disorder back into the, in the mainstream of normal patterns of life. They are uh, uh, the ones who are enabled to take up occupations in life, so to say. So the therapies are very much client-centered in order to restore certain impairments. Yet another example of the offerings is the orthotic and prosthetic workshop. Now this is where they make the artificial limbs. The orthotics is the art of making those parts that relate to your feet and uh, they make uh, the complete uh, the feet, they also make uh, the braces, joints, and they are also uh, into uh, the making um, other limbs uh, which are uh, the part of prosthetics. Anyway, uh, here I'm not uh, to uh, educate you about uh, these uh, the particular uh, components of uh, the medical uh, the science and areas, but my uh, intention here is to highlight all those areas of products which are not similar to what the hospital is doing or which are dissimilar to what they're doing and which also happen to be a different market altogether, but still they are undertaking their initiatives to introduce new offerings. Another example, which of course is from the area of market diversification, is that the hospital has started a skill development center where they impart training in areas as diverse as the computers, meaning computer skills, and mobile telephone repairs, and the stitching and sewing. Just imagine the kind of the jobs they're doing there, but there is one common link. And that is something which I really want to highlight here. And that is, even if you are offering new products, which could be similar, which could be dissimilar, and the markets which you are operating in could be similar and could be totally dissimilar. For example, the market of stitching and sewing or the market of mobile repairs or computer skills have no similarities with the hospital or with the one which specializes in basically orthopedics but they're operating in those areas because the link is the patients or the population they're dealing with. So in other words, what I'm saying is, even when we consider uh, getting into those markets which are dissimilar, we've got to first of all, be very clear about the link which we may be able to develop between what we have been doing or what we are doing with what we intend doing. So the um, common thread here is that uh, a link has to be developed. It is not that uh, the, they have gotten into an area which has nothing to do with people who are not able-bodied. As a matter of fact, they are trying their best in order to treat people, um, in order to uh, recover people, and in order to make them get back into the mainstream of normal life, which may be a little less than absolutely normal, and those people still remain very special. But the fact is, they are there not only to treat those patients, they are there also to enhance uh, the level of self-importance and dignity. So that is where the crux is. But don't forget one factor. It still remains very, very strategic. Thank you very much.